once upon a tabletop, some adventurers gather to investigate a mystery. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Rutledge, and this is episode 5 of Colonial Cardia Lark's Landing, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign being played at a local board game cafe called The Devil's Bench. The adventurers have started building their house on the top of the hill where they plan to eventually expand it into a fort. The rain that inspired them to build their home has also inspired others. Just about everyone who doesn't already have shelter have started construction. A family of tieflings comes along, planning to build a house on the land reserved for the fort. The adventurers point this out to them and get told that there's nowhere else to build inside the palisade. Indeed, the adventurers knew all along that there wasn't enough room for everyone on the hill. They decide to take the matter to what is loosely being referred to as the Council, a group of 14 individuals who are respected throughout the community. After much discussion, the Council determines that enough land should be saved for a small town hall. Beyond that, the main priority is to have as many people as possible living inside the wall. Most of the homes being built are simple anyways and aren't meant to last forever. Land for a fort can be cleared later if it's deemed necessary. As the council's dispersing, Kordak, the half-orc fighter, mentions to store the goblin monk that he could use a drink. He says that they could really use a tavern. At this, one of the council members, a strawberry blonde half-elf named Wyatt, pipes up. He says that he's already working on building a tavern, although he doesn't have any alcohol available yet. Thor and Kordak, who want to open a tavern of their own, start scoping out this potential competition. However, after a few questions, they realize that Wyatt is far more interested in interacting with the people in the tavern than actually running it. They make a loose deal to partner with him. Everyone returns to their work. As they're nearing completion of their house, the adventurers are noticing that it's harder to find the materials they need. Thor mentions that he noticed a stockpile outside Naldor's house, but the group decides that they don't want to deal with that racist. They take the time to gather the resources themselves. They complete their house on the 21st of Waxing Spring. The next day, Stor goes out to collect his lizard hide from the tanner. He's planning to make some clothing out of it. Of course, for that, he needs something to sew it with. He asks around and finds Jelba, a human weaver who is also a member of the council. She gladly gives him an extra needle and thread. As Stor is leaving, Jelba's daughter runs up, saying, Mama, who's Gilligan? Catching the name of his humanistic friend, Stor pauses to listen. What's that, my dear? Jelba asks. Gilligan, who's Gilligan? A man came out of the jungle and told me to give a message to Gilligan. Stor walks over, saying that he knows Gilligan. The child says, you do? I'm supposed to tell Gilligan that there's something one day to the east that might interest him. Stor promises to deliver the message, but before leaving, asks what the man from the jungle looked like. The response was simply that it was a robed man. Feeling the message is quite urgent, he returns home to tell Gilligan. When he arrives, Kordak and Shent, the Dwarven Ranger, tell him that Gilgan has wandered off. Stor goes out looking for him. Gilgan has gone to check on Triana, a pregnant human priestess of the Four. She is directing the construction of a temple to the four seasonal gods who wield the most power in the Pantheon. Gilgan has just gotten through determining that everything is well with her when Stor shows up with his message. Hearing it, he immediately goes into a panic. He makes Thor take him to the child who delivered the message in the first place and uses his telepathic power to touch the child's mind. He instructs the child to focus on the picture of the person who delivered the message. The image he receives is of a towering, hooded figure with no face, surrounded by colorful sparkles and pastel creatures in the background that probably aren't actually real. Still panicking, he takes Thor back to their house to regroup with the others. He tells them that they have to leave immediately and head to the east. When questioned, he gabbles about someone from his past, but won't give any details. He says the person is very dangerous and shouldn't be able to be here. He also implies that they might need wooden stakes. Uncertain as to what exactly is going on, but guessing vampires are involved, the group agrees to accompany Gilgan. They only travel for the first half of the day, deciding that they would rather arrive in daylight. They make camp early and set out again the next morning. When they reach a point that Shen says is about a day's journey from their settlement, they begin to investigate. Just a little further into the jungle, they find themselves at the top of a sheer cliff dropping down into a pile of rubble that obscures part of the jungle. Gilgan jumps straight down, using his psionic powers to land smoothly. The others tie off a rope and follow down more slowly. While waiting for his companions, Gilgan explores through the rubble. It looks as though a long time ago something destroyed this section of the hill. In amongst the rubble, he begins to find odd stones that look as though they may have been shaped, possibly to be cobblestones. Then he comes across one that looks like it was a tombstone. As he bends in closer to examine it, a spectral hand rises out of it. Instinctively, Gilgan punches it. The twisted, ghostly form of a human man rises out of it and attacks Gilgan. From the stone next to it, a female form rises and also attacks. 
The others rush in to help. Their weapons seem to do very little damage to these ghostly figures, but on the other hand, the specters seem to be struggling in the daylight. The creatures are dispatched, and they begin to discuss what this could mean. Is this the place that Gilligan was being sent to? If so, it was a very weak trap for him. Perhaps it was a distraction to get them out of the settlement. They decide to look around for more clues. While the others search around the rubble, finding a few cobblestone-like rocks and maybe what was once a brick, Kordak decides to dig up the graves. He eventually finds a gold ring which he pockets, but even after seven feet he doesn't find any bones. The gravestones are no help either, since they're so worn that they're illegible. Concerned for their settlement, they start heading back, bringing one of the gravestones as proof of what they found. This is the first time they've seen any sign of other civilization. Pablo, Gilgan's paraphamiliar, is sent on ahead. He's instructed to find out if anything is wrong at the settlement and report back. After about two hours of travel, night comes and they make camp for the night. Gilgan takes the first watch, staying up late to wait for Pablo's return. The grey, cat-eyed bird flies into camp around 3 a.m. He reports that he saw nothing wrong at camp. Certain that something must be amiss, Gilgan starts grilling Pablo. When he finds out that his familiar only did a quick 10 minute sweep, he starts yelling at him, telling him that anything could be wrong. Partway through the diatribe, Pablo simply flies off. The rest of the night passes uneventfully. In the morning, having received news that the settlement is safe, they decide to go back to the pile of rubble. They're certain that there must be some information that they missed. They also believe it's possible that this isn't the location they were meant to find. While scouting in the surrounding jungle, Shen finds some plants that seem to have been harvested. Someone else has been here. Whoever it was had been very careful. Shen was able to find only traces of footprints and nothing that he could track. He decides to set up his hunting track and wait and watch for a while. Store sets a trap as well. Meanwhile, Gilgan is using some of his magic to repair the gravestones. He discovers the names Roltak and Jitrek, accompanied with dates that make no sense to him at all. This only adds to the mystery. After spending much of the day searching around, they decide to head home. Before leaving, Shend and Storr make sure their traps are well hidden, and Storr says a prayer over the graves, which are now unmarked as they're bringing both headstones back with them. They spend the night at the top of the cliff and then head home in the morning. It's evening by the time they arrive, but they go straight to Deltria to tell her what they found. She wants to spread the word of other possible civilizations, but the adventurers counsel her silence. They don't want to start a panic or have people wandering off into the jungle before they know what's really going on. They head home for the night. Before going to sleep, Kordak and Shen decide they must discover which of the two of them is stronger. They have a wrestling match which Kordak wins without too much trouble. Stor decides to take on the winner. Kordak wins without much trouble. Then Shen and Stor decide to have it out, this time with fists. With his unarmed training, Stor easily wins. Meanwhile, Gilgan finds that Pablo had returned to the settlement to watch over it and report if anything had gone wrong. Pleased to be reunited with his familiar, he ignores his rambunctious companions. At last, they all go to sleep. In the morning, they discover that the palisade was completed while they were away. They are pleased with how everything is progressing and decide to take a day off. They've been spending a lot of time running around, so now they want to take a chance to explore the settlement that has been growing around them. Gilgan goes off on his own, wearing silver rings and shaking hands of people and trying to find anything that may be wrong. He understandably receives mixed receptions from people. The others head out to the farmland so Stor and Kordak can make connections for when they start their brewing enterprise. They encounter a gnome named Natat, who they know from the council meeting. All of the farmers in the area seem to be reporting to her. They have a good conversation with her and offer to bring back seeds and plant samples that might be useful for growing. Next they head off to see what sort of establishments are growing. They already know about Wyatt's Tavern, but they pause when they come to Nalder's building. While asking around about various products, they have several times been directed to Naldor. They really don't want to talk with him, but they decide that they may as well go in and find what sort of shop he has. They go in knowing full well that Naldor doesn't respond kindly to the less-than-human races. They are surprised when he acknowledges them with a neutral tone. He doesn't show any of the aggression they've seen from him before. When they ask him about his shop, he says, I trade things. It's what I do. If you need something, I can get it for you. Looking around, Shen finds that he does seem to have a variety of items. There, talking to a man they can no longer get a read on is where this week's session comes to an end. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe, and hey, tell me what you think in the comments section down below. If you want to support the channel, there's a link in the doobly-doo, as well as a link to my website where you can buy chainmail from me. 
I'd also like to give a huge shout out to Kevin McCloyd over at Incompetech. He's the one who makes all the great music you hear in the background. And that's it for today. Come back next week to find out what happens next, once upon a tabletop.